Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm going to shed my mask. I don't know if you can see in the room how many people we've got. We've got this great space, and we're missing a lot of people from Albuquerque and Santa Fe that could have driven down and attended this to attend and see Tom Martin. Uh, but to everybody here in the room, uh, thanks for joining us. We've got pizza and drinks in the back. Over here, we've got Hazel and Tom set up with all of his books. Um, we've got people online. Hopefully, everybody can hear us okay. I want to thank Jewish Community Center for giving us, well, affording us this venue. We were pinched for a proper venue to house enough people that see Tom Martin. So this space worked out really well. And uh, I'm glad they make this available to the community. Also, I want to point out and give kudos to Donna for doing all of our IT setup stuff. Without her, these meetings, uh, if they relied on me, it wouldn't happen. So thank you, Donna. Uh, today is November 8th. I have to write it all down. AWC News. Can, can, can people hear us out in Zoom land? We've got Donna monitoring our Zoom chat, so if you have yes, questions, okay. uh, we'll probably hold questions until the end for Tom, but uh, please chime in on chat and, and raise your hand, or if you're having trouble with your audio or visual, uh, maybe you can get to Donna on there as well, Donna's monitoring that. Uh, real quick, AWC membership is a rolling 12-month period, so if you any time to get involved, it's $15. We do a lot of great things for the community, and it's a lot of fun to be involved with the club. So please join. Uh, monthly meetings are now hybrid. Uh, we realized that the value of doing remote and virtual, people don't have to attend, especially during COVID when it's difficult. But now you don't have to travel down from Los Alamos or Virginia or uh, other places to join us. Um, AWC clinics were a great success this year. We didn't think they were going to have to, but we got off several intermediate and beginner clinics. We had a swim water clinic session up on Rio Grande. So uh, thanks to Carmen and Jamie for organizing that. And Don was a big help with those. All the instructors that helped volunteer to teach those. Uh, pool sessions, uh, first and third Sunday of each month are at Sandia High School Pool. Cost is minimal. I think it's five bucks. I have to verify that. But I think there was 18 people that attended last night, Sunday. So it's a great success. And as long as we can keep our numbers up, then we'll be able to continue that program through the Albuquerque Aquatic Center. Uh, cleanup events, we try to do those the first Saturday of every autumn month. Uh, that would have been this last Saturday, November 6th. We decided to push it out, trying to get into another. Venue, uh, the Oro Verde, but they're doing construction, so we couldn't get in there. So watch for announcements this week. Uh, it will happen Saturday, the 13th, and it'll probably be at Poco Loco uh, down at the Rio Bravo Bridge on the Rio Grande here in Albuquerque. Uh, it's an area that needs constant attention to keep it clean, so we'll probably be there. Uh, there we go. Advocacy and updates. Are we showing that? Hopefully I'm not in the way of your view here for that. Uh, not a lot has happened with the stream access. Uh, a bit of mandamus that we have in front of the Supreme Court. They have not made any decision on that. One major development, though, is we got the, the New Mexico Paddlers Coalition, which uh, AWC supports. Uh, several of our members are on that board. Sherry Barrett was very instrumental in initiating a grant for the 550 bridge access area. Uh, we've done cleanups there in the past. Uh, it's a popular area to run from Algodonas down to 550 or 550 down to the Morales area. Like the beach. It's a great access area. It's going to get better. Uh, this $25,000 grant, and we're working with Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. In the town of Bellevue. there's going to be a park there. There's going to be two ramps, one above the bridge, one below the bridge, to take out for the Algodonas or to launch for the Siphon Beach area. 
great asset for our community. Uh, the fire department has already done a lot of work there to mitigate some of the risks. Some of the old rebar that was in, in the old bridge pilings, they've cut that out. They've removed that big pile of driftwood that was collected on it. So it's, they made it a lot safer. Uh, eventually, the project starts construction in January and they have up to 24 months. It probably won't take that long. But eventually when they're done, it'll be a parking area uh, just on the northeast, north of the bridge, east of the river. Uh, there'll be a gate there. Uh, there'll be another gate down by the river. We've got to figure out how we're going to do trailer access for Roush. Uh, maybe a combination or a key that we can check out to the paddling community. Uh, that's a great uh, milestone and accomplishment to get that grant. Uh, you can find information about that 550 project on the New Mexico Paddlers Coalition Facebook page. Uh, I encourage people to always log into the adobewhitewater.org. That's our website, and from there you can get follow through the links to see what's happening with the club, so many other events that are that are going around the community. That Adobe or uh, AWC chat is a, a kind of a private Facebook page. Uh, that's where a lot of the activity and trip planning and things like that happens. So I encourage people to sign up and be a member of the Adobe Whitewater Club. Uh, check out our website. Stay informed and go to that Facebook page and see what's happening. Now we can move on to the main attraction. That's Tom Martin. Next slide. Tom Martin volunteers for the River Runners for the Wilderness and writes river running history books as well as hiking and traveling guides for Western Rivers. Uh, as evident by this great stack of books over here, if you buy one tonight, a lot of graphic. This is going to be an hour long presentation about. Uh, an experiment, interesting experiment that Tom did. He built a two-way reed raft and navigated it through the Grand Canyon just to see if it could be done and to, to see if Al was really the first one that may have done that. Tom will go into a lot more detail on that. Tom is uh, with Vishnu Temple Press out of Flagstaff, Arizona, and he's been very generous uh, in assigning any of the book sales for that website uh, for November 8th, 9th, and 10th towards the Adobe Whitewater Club. And from those sales, it's going to donate a, a percentage of that back to the Adobe Whitewater Club. So big thanks to Tom and Hazel for, for being very generous and coming out from Flagstaff to attend this presentation and uh, autographing books. And you'll be entertained by Tom. I've seen him before. He's very animated. So without further ado, I'll bring Tom up for a trip through the Grand Canyon on a two-way reed raft. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Scott. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This is a, uh, an amazing sort of deal because there's Zoom people out there out in Zoom land and real people here where real people are. People in Zoom. When things like that happen, just put it in chat. I don't know what happened, but the whole thing just exploded. <laughs> and you can let Donna know that's what's going on now in theory. Donna's working mad to get this, like start this Zoom thing, which happens over there through two computers. And it goes out, you know, uh, this way and that. <laughs> this work <laughs> and and she's trying to watch the chat as well so the zoom people can say yeah this is working okay or not this presentation is going to take about 50 minutes so the people in zoom land are lucky because they can like go make a cup of tea you people that are sitting here and you get it can't so so it's what it is and i'm going to now click the clicker to see if something actually happens are you ready donna i am cool let's see what happens uh, nothing. Uh, let me try again. Just a minute. Let me go the other way. Uh, nothing. Uh, let me try again. Let me go back the other way. I'll do that first. Oh, one. there you go. I did that. Donna did that. Now I'm gonna go back. Yeah. This presentation is brought to you by brought to you by Adobe Whitewater Club. 
And who is this club and what do they do? I went the wrong way. Ha. Ah. Okay. River protection. River access. Paddling clinics, cleanups, and river safety. My first question is Are you a member? Because if you are, that's awesome. If you are not in Zoom land, you need to be a member. And it's $15 a year. I mean, come on, you spend it on the top, right? So you want to be a member. It's very simple. The board of directors tonight of this organization, how many board of directors are here in this room? Show of hands. Hey, Donna, come here. Scott, come here. I don't know your name. Come here. Come on, get up. Come here. So you people need to stand there where the Zoom people can see you, oh. right? Okay. <laughs> That's it. I can't hear the person. Real people doing real advocacy is a wonderful thing. So thank you so very much. To you, to do all this wonderful stuff for fifteen bucks a year. Come on, you can do this. All right, I'm gonna push the button again. See, you've done this. You can move all this stuff. All right, you want to try again? Yeah. All right, I'm going the wrong way though. So this is good. It's working. All right, so this is a fundraiser tonight that Scott mentioned. Proceeds of the book sales here on site and in Zoom land for the next three days at Vishnu Temple Press. Proceeds are going to Adobe Whitewater Club. So what do we got there? Well, we got the books and we went way too fast. The river maps, there are four of them. There's a new, this is new, Canyon Lens, second edition, Grand Canyon, eighth edition. There's also history books, big water little boats. They talk about that. The first Mackenzie River Dory to go through Grand Canyon. Otis Marston's giant thick tome of the first 100 river runners to go through Grand Canyon. There is a hiking book I wrote here. If you want to get lost in Grand Canyon, that's your book. And let's see, I'm trying again the little button here. Now, Let's see, it's not going down. So let's see what you can do on your end. Like with technology, mm -hmm. that's it. So Beverly Kurtz out of Boulder, Colorado edited Why We Boat. It's a compendium of river stories by a bunch of great writers. Let's try again, see if that works. No, not, not still not happy. Wait, it did it. John Fuller. Birdie River Elegy. Elegy, like something's like not so good. John Fuller, Gila River Elegy. This is history. It's a guidebook. He's a great writer. So dial into John either on the website or on the table over there. There are a ton of books here. The one I'm going to tell you about is this one Bobby Brighty and the Wiley Way. How many of you read the story Brighty of the Grand Canyon when you were a little kid? A couple hands going up here. Well, Brighty had a little boy befriend him, the burro, you know, and the little boy's name was Bobby. Well, Bobby grew up and Bobby got married and Bobby had his own kids. And now his daughter, Martha, in her 70s, writes about her dad and the family history on the North Rim of Grand Canyon. It's a wonderful little book. This is a fundraiser for Adobe Whitewater Club, and you're going to get sick of me saying. <laughs> so I might put the mic a little bit closer to you because they're having a hard time with Zoom land here. Okay. So I'm going to get closer to the mic, yeah. says Donna. All right. We'll do that. And is we'll that see what happens. Tony? Tony, what do you got? Nothing yet. Nothing yet, says Go Tony. So you're going to have to advance that slide, Donna, because. There it is. So tonight, here and on the web, 20 years ago, roughly, this book came out. 
Peaceful Canyon, Golden River. This book is about Glen Canyon before Glen Canyon Dam. So it is full of photographs of Glen Canyon before the dam. It's out of print, but we have a box of these books from the family, from the Gaskell family. We are selling these tonight, again, as a fundraiser, $14 a copy. And let's see if I try it again. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm desperately pushing this button. Donna's gonna have to come save me. It's his. It's whose? It's his, his clicker. Oh, well, I, it's, it's, it's my fault. It's not your clicker. Your clicker is fine. I'm sure it's my thumb. Okay, just, just a, a sample page here of what's in this book. That's tapestry wall here. Just some amazing pictures of this place before it went down. So I encourage you to look at that. Donna's gonna try a new battery while she advances the slide here. Okay, so these things are a real nuisance. When you give presentations, can you take your cell phone, those people that are here on site, you people in Zoom land, I don't care if your phone rings or somebody's knocking on the door. What I do here, so take your cell phone and turn it off or make it like super quiet. And, oh, new battery. Mm. Let's see what happens. Let's try it now. Wow. You people in Zoom land are lucky because you're gonna type your questions in the chat box as I go along. People that are here in the room are gonna wait until the end when you're gonna start chucking your questions at me along with Donna, who's gonna be chucking in the Zoom questions. So that's how the questions and answers are gonna work. Now, if you find yourself, oh, Donna. Are you serious? <laughs> serious. I don't know these things. If you find yourself bursting out laughing, that's what's supposed to happen. So don't hold back. You can laugh at me, you can laugh at the slides, you can laugh at Pete Brown as you see him carnaging through rapid after rapid after rapid. That's what it's all about. Now let's try again. Through Grand Canyon on a Thule Reed raft or are you nuts? Yeah, that's the title for tonight's presentation. Let's open this up a little bit and see what we got. So there's a bunch of people here having a really good time. End of a river trip. You've seen this before, except that there's something wrong. There's a guy lying on the ground there on the left. You see that guy there? Well, like he was trying to run back through the bow lines with the camera going boop, boop, boop on the tripod, right? And hit the rope and head on, just laying no. That's me there. And there's a reason why I'm laying flat on my back. <clears throat> is because I got an email from the park service. I don't normally get emails from the park service. But it said, <clears throat> you have won a Grand Canyon River trip. I'm like, oh my God. I just, I fainted dead away. <laughs> because I've been playing this lottery since 2006 and I only play for winter river trips December January I'm a winter kind of guy I have won once in 2006 <clears throat> I couldn't believe it so I'm like Ooh, ooh we're going boating now, some of you are like, well, you know what? We're, we're New Mexico boaters and we don't really know where the Grand Canyon is. So maybe you could tell us. So I'm like, okay, this is a map. People like maps, right? This is the Colorado River Basin and the Wind Rivers. I don't know if you can see that little laser pointer. I don't see it. I don't see it either. Yeah, back to Donna with the laser pointer. <clears throat> Did I turn it off? It turned off when it changed the battery. Oh, got it. She, she's so smart. The Wind Rivers way up here in, North, in Southern Wyoming, all the way down to the Sea of Cortez, way down here. The Grand Canyon <clears throat> is in this section here. And these river trips start 
in the central, north central part of Arizona and go all the way over to Las Vegas on the west side. So it's 280 miles. I'm gonna take the full time Grand Canyon National Park is gonna give me in their permits, which is 30 days. So that's where we're going. Now I built this replica of a 1953 McKenzie River dory. And I'm like, I'm gonna take my little toy boat through the Grand Canyon. This is gonna be really fun. And that's my hard suffering wife there, Hazel Clark on the front of the thing going, what am I doing? But there she is fish eyeing this dory. And I wrote all about that, go back, Go back, go back, go back, go back. In this book, Big Water Little Boats, which we're selling tonight as a fundraiser for Adobe Whitewater Club. So if you want to know about this 1953 first Mackenzie River Dory to come to Grand Canyon, that's your book. I have been spending a lot of time behind bars. Well, behind the bars of the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, specifically in this, this building, which has a room, this giant cavernous room inside of the building with no windows. And you go in and you report in and they sign you a table and you sit at your table and they bring you, get to bring out the boxes. Boxes of what? What is in there? This guy who's long since dead, Otis Reed Marston died in 1979. Somehow for 30 years, talk about nuts. He decided he wanted to figure out the history of river running on the Colorado River. So he got with the program in 1948. The Huntington started backstopping him in 1949. And for the next 30 years, he put together 430 boxes we're talking about big boxes, 430 of them of Colorado River history. And I'm now going through box after box after box. Are you nuts? I'm just saying. But the stuff I'm learning in here about John Wesley Powell and the first documented, uh-oh, hey, I see Hazel waving her head. No, 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 what happened? I went to uh, Powell, 1869. Okay, the first Powell trip. The things I'm learning about this first documented through the Grand Canyon River trip. Just amazing stuff. Let's try again. Uh uh. Go back. Ah, there it is. 1923, the surveyors came along, USGS, and they mapped the entire Grand Canyon, and everything changed for river runners because there was a map. And I could see where I was going. But the coolest thing out of the Marston collection is Kathy Paul and Edith Kolb stealing one of the USGS boats here. And the photographer, the remote camera, you know, out in the parking lot got a picture of them as they were pulling away. It's in the Marston collection. It's the coolest deal. Also, I learned that the first Grand Canyon boating permit went to Norman Neville's in 1947. Anybody know this? I mean, who knows this stuff? It's just like, wait a minute, 47? Yeah, boy, there's some history there. Amazing stuff. And then of course, the boat that I like, the gem here, multi-formers in the right, swimming in the water there. Guy that built the boat and his story. All this stuff is at the Huntington. It's really cool. Here's another. Huntington photo. What I've learned as I study Marston is the people with their hands on the oars have a story, but it's the people in the back of the boat <laughs> that are thinking about these stories going, that doesn't make sense. And that's, that's a, one of the main concepts of this presentation tonight is what we know with the people on the hands on the oars and their story, is it correct? And do we have to start rethinking our assumptions? So let's dig into this. 
Most of us know that for at least 13,000 years, indigenous people have been in the Americas, north and south, from Tierra del Fuego all the way up to the Arctic Circle. We are, we are European people, I'm sorry, we're late to the gate. We are way late. Okay, fair enough. The indigenous peoples are boaters. I need a show of hands in this room. I can't see in Zoom land. How many of you have a kayak? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven people in this room have a kayak. Show of hands again. How many of you know how to roll that kayak upside down, do the little wiggy hibble, you know, and you come back up again? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Guess what? The indigenous people figured this out thousands of years before you ever bought your whatever it was, and they figured out how to roll them. The entire community would get in their two and three seater and one seater kayaks and go from island to island to island every year. Huh? Canoes, anybody in this room got a canoe? I see two, I see three. Okay, guess what? Indigenous people, birch bark canoes, they got way before we showed up, they were doing incredible stuff with this. Just amazing. Little tippy boat there in the middle, the dugout canoe on the far side, bull boats. Those are skin on frame, open, big, kind of like, like in a teacup, kind of dangerous. On the lower right is a boat I am learning about made of vegetation. Show of hands again. Who's got an inflatable kayak? Oh, there's a lot of hands up here. Guess what? That looks like an awful lot like an inflatable kayak down there in the lower right, doesn't it? Let's open that boat up. Okay. Donna, you're on. What do you got? See what you can do. There it is. Okay, how many of you have a stand-up paddleboard? Okay, I got I got a couple of hands here for stand-up paddleboards. Guess what? Guess who has you so beat? You don't know what's going on. I think, oh yeah, I'm doing something new. I got a stand-up paddleboard. Oh yeah, talk to me. <laughs> now I this picture is really hard to see. But I'm going to delve into this picture a little bit because this is a beautiful boat. This is a truly read boat. And there are a whole bunch of bindings to hold this boat together. And they're about four inches apart. There's a whole bunch of them there. That is a beautiful boat. That boat will last you, oh gosh, easy, six months. And about the time the, the, the fall rains come, you can take this apart, you can make a pair of shoes with it, and then you can shingle your house with it. This is amazing stuff. This is just amazing stuff. So how does this relate to the Colorado River and John Wesley Powell, you want to know? The Pipa Makav, the Kokopa, the Mojave and the Gila Indians, all had truly read boats. These are indigenous peoples below the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. They knew how to swim. They knew how to fish. They knew how to boat. And they were really good at it. And when the Spaniards showed up in 1540, they saw all these people in their stand up paddle boards and their truly read inflatable kayaks paddling around. And one of the first names for the Colorado River is El Rio de las Balsas, the river of boats. How cool is that? From the San Francisco Bay all the way down to Peru using native tule. There they are in these amazing boats, just beautiful boats. I don't know nothing about this. I'm going to take my little dory through Grand Canyon. How cool is that? Oh, got this one. I'm going to read this to you. So this is the Whipple expedition crossing the Colorado River in the winter of 1853, 1854. 
The artist was Bobby Mulhausen, who had a wonderful sense of humor that described the terrible time they had getting across the Colorado River in this very awkward boat, which at one point tipped over completely and all their supplies dunked in the water. And the Mojave, who had their flexible raft that they could steer, went round and round and picked up all the supplies. And it was his conclusion they should have hired the Mojaves in the first place, which a lot of people did. So you gotta dig to find this stuff, to start putting the pieces together. These boats are still made today by indigenous peoples, not so much here in the US, but down in Peru, they're still used to fish. They're still using these boats as utility boats, which is really cool. And they're beautiful. They're really beautiful. I learned a ton of stuff. I, the boat we made was like a whisk broom compared to these beautiful boats that these people are making. So how does this relate to Grand Canyon? Well, there are two indigenous nations, the Hopi and the Navajo. Both of them have legends of their peoples paddling through the Grand Canyon. Oh, okay. This is kind of getting interesting now. So I'm digging through the Marston collection. This is Otis Marston on the right. And the guy on the left is a hiker out of Flagstaff, Arizona named Harvey Butcher. And these guys are great friends and they send letters to each other like Scott Carpenter and I send text messages back and forth, and back and forth, and back. At one point, Marston on the right sends a letter to Harvey on the left and says, hey, there's an old timer that lives in your town of Flagstaff, Arizona. And the old timer was in the Grand Canyon in the 1880s. And this is in 1958 that this letter's going back and forth. And Marston says to Harvey, take the guy a bottle of scotch and get him talking. And Harvey's like, yeah, sign me up, I'll do that. And he does it and they have a great night. And Harvey sends the next letter back to Marston and it says this. <laughs> Up in Nekoweep, a very special ruin that he had been told about is supposed to contain a boat made of some kind of rushes. I've got a river trip coming up. The light bulb <laughs> finally goes off. Hey! And I'm thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. who's going to paddle it? Who's going to run safety? Can I get permission? How do I build it? Will it even float? Will it keep up with the rafts, you know, as they cruise along down the river? What's going to happen to the little boat? So I got a zillion questions. And by now I'm running out of time because the park service says on December 30th, you've got to launch and move on down the ramp. And I'm a little late, it's now November. No, not November, it's earlier than that, but it's like last fall. So I'm like, okay, let's get going. Can we do this? The first person I wanna to talk to is a guy named Peter Brown. Pete's a good friend of mine. We go way back. We boated the canyon before. He's a good solid, rafter. He's never kayaked before, but I'm like, that fits perfectly. I want to put somebody in a truly reed boat that knows nothing about how to kayak. So he goes out to Walmart and buys a paddle. This would be great. If Pete says he'll do it, he'll do it. Okay, you don't have to think about it. He just, he says he'll do it, he'll do it. That's Peter Brown. Peter Brown and I go way back into exploring abandoned mines back in the in the 1970s when we were little kids. So you trust the guy with my life, it's easy to do. So that's Pete, he says he's gonna do it. I'm like, hey, he's gonna do it. Who's gonna run safety? Well, I'm talking back and forth with a guy named Phil Gormley and Phil's like, you're gonna do what with a what? And I'm like, yeah, and I need somebody to run safety. And he's like, well, let me talk to my daughter. She's 19, she has never kayaked the Grand Canyon, but 
she's a good solid kayaker and I'll ask her. And Fiona's like, yeah, I'll go and I'll start my thousand roll training to get really good at my role before we go in Grand Canyon. Okay, so I know who's gonna try this thing. I know who's gonna run safety. Now we, we work with Fiona to let Pete almost drown, make sure Pete stays with his boat and leave him alone. Okay, because this is a test. Fiona's like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. So the next thing we need to do is we need to ask for permission. I know where some of this stuff grows. I've seen it before. And it's down near Blythe, California on the Colorado River. Thule, what we're gonna to use to make this boat is native in Grand Canyon. It grows in the Wind Rivers. It's throughout the entire Colorado River. It, it's in Glen Canyon. It's, it's, in, it's in the basin. So I call, I, think I emailed the BLM. Dup, 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 dup. I said, hey, I wanna harvest some Thule. They're like, well, you mean cattails, right? <laughs> no, I want to harvest some Thule. Oh, you mean Phragmites, right? The great reed? Tap, 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 tap. No, I want to harvest some Thule. I'll, let me get the Latin name for you. I can't pronounce it. They said, how much do you want? I said, how about a truckload? Because I don't know how much I want. And they said, okay, fine. You sound crazy. You sound like you're nuts. If you're successful, they'll let us know. I said, great. That's all I needed. Meanwhile, I got Pete, because Pete's good at this stuff. Pete, you start sending emails to the park service. Hey, I got this idea. I want to try to take this Thule Reed boat through the Grand Canyon. It's native to Grand Canyon National Park. I will freeze it for two weeks ahead of launch to kill all the exotic micro buggies that might be in the Thule, okay? Because we don't want to mess with anything. We don't want to like pollute the park with coagula muscle or anything like that. And at night, we're gonna wrap the thing in a kitchen tarp so the beaver don't eat it. <laughs> what do you think? And the park finally all goes through, all oh, that email chain went forever. And finally someone, some, you know, some office somewhere said, yeah, okay, so long as you, it's not your main boat, so long as you're not relying on it to carry your, your kitchen and your pooper and your pocket pads and all that <laughs> junk you're gonna bring along. And we printed all that correspondence out and I put it in my pocket. And then what happened? Is it not done? It? Yep. Donna to the rescue. I think when I moved my mouth, this is just Ah. And then I contacted this guy, Charlie Kennard. The indigenous peoples of the Colorado River have forgotten how to build this stuff. Who builds it? Where do you go? Charlie Kennard is a guy in California who still builds stuff out of plants including boats. And I'm like, gee, Mr. Kennard, you know, I got this idea. I want to take this thing through the Grand Canyon. And he's just so nice. I said, what do I do? How do I do it? He says, cut the stuff off at the ground, let it dry out two weeks, bundle it up together and good luck because it'll never work. <laughs> I'm like, Charlie, you're the expert. Why won't it work? He said, oh, I've seen the videos about Grand Canyon. Oh, they're terrible whitewater there. It kills people. I'm like, all right, thanks. Now the trouble is I took those words for granted. Charlie said it wouldn't work. So it's not gonna work, but let's go through the exercise anyway. This is Blythe and my heart's suffering. Uh oh, Hazel's like, no, 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 it didn't work, went too far. Uh, oh, we gotta go back one. Uh, yeah, okay, don't move that mouse. There. <laughs> I'm gonna go back one more, yep. So we go out to Blythe and we're from Flagstaff at 7,000 feet. It's almost sea level here. It is really hot. Well, that's the stuff. And this is how tall it is. It's really tall. It's like 12 feet tall, this stuff. So I got the kitchen knife out of the kitchen tied to my wrist and I'm crawling around on my hands and knees in here, cutting this stuff off at the water. It's muddy in there and it's hot, humid. And I'm passing these things out to Hazel. If you look at your thumb, 
truly at the ground level is about the diameter of your thumb. And you can hold it. I could tickle your nose over there. The guy's falling asleep. This would be great. If I had a toolie, I would tickle his nose. And he would wait for the start and I could run and I would have a 12 foot head start. Can you imagine how the, how the indigenous kids terrorize their parents when they were taking a nap? <laughs> wow. It's amazing stuff. So we harvest it all up. Oh, I'm gonna go back for a minute. I forgot to tell you that I can't pronounce this. Arenchyma, arenchyma, whatever it's called, truly takes air and pumps it down to its roots. That's what makes it buoyant. I didn't know that. It's got a Latin name. I can't pronounce that either. So we bundle it up. I'm handing this stuff out to Hazel. She's throwing it up on top of the truck. We drive back to Flagstaff. We throw it in the backyard. Now it's late. It's October now. Okay. And it's cold in Flagstaff, but we put it out on the back porch. And are you going to get the next one for me? Oh. Because I saw you move that mouse. Yep. Oh, back up. We dry it out. Yep. And we take these bundles and we start to take, take all the tooling and we start bundling it up together. Let's see how I can do. Yep. Stacy Davenport's going to be with us on our river trip. I'm going to introduce all these people to you. Stacy comes up from Prescott and says, I want to help build this thing. We're like, great, come on up. So there's the little dory that I'm going to row on the right. And this is what Stacy and Hazel and I are doing. Remember this distance about four inches between these bundles. Or, or as you wrap it. So we're, we're trying to match that, but I'm a little worried. So we're adding a couple extra wraps. And I'm thinking, what am I gonna call this thing? And I realized, boy, there's a lots of knots holding this thing together. So we're gonna call it lots of knots. <laughs> or if I'm a little fast and loose with language, lots of nuts, okay? Because you people are crazy. But it's a beautiful little boat. Now I had asked Charlie, Charlie, how do you make a bow in this thing? And he'd said, just wrap it up really tight, bend it up and just wrap it up really tight. We did that and it fell flat. And what Charlie didn't tell me is that if you find a curved piece of wood and you put that in the middle bundle and you tie that together, it'll stay up. He told me that after we got back at the end of the trip, I'm like, Charlie, I, I, but this is a whisk broom. The cool thing about Thule is it smells good. It's got this great, I'm just, oh my gosh, it smells really great. So finally, we get the thing out of the garage. There it is. There's Hazel. We're thinking that it doesn't float. We'll find out. So it's December 29th. It's like snowing in Flagstaff. You throw the thing on the back of the trailer. You drive up to the put-in. And the first thing you do is like take off all your jackets because it's really nice. Don't tell anybody how nice it is. All right. We're not done building the boat. Charlie had said that the indigenous people would put a dowel, would put a dowel, a couple of them, drive them right through the bundles to add strength. And they would use willow trunks. Okay, well, we had a Home Depot and I got some dowels from Home Depot on a hammer and pop, 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 just drove a couple of dowels through. <clears throat> okay, fine. Just because Charlie said, right? Charlie said it wouldn't work. It's not going to work, but let's see what happens. The next thing I know, Pete Brown grabs this thing down and puts it in the water. And the ramp ranger, this wonderful woman I've known for decades, she kind of rocks back on her heels. She's just kind of rocking back like this with her Sig Sauer on her side and her, you know, bulletproof vest. And she's like, whoa, because there goes Pete. What, 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 why didn't we expect this? Why, why didn't we think this would happen? I'm like, Charlie said it wouldn't work. I don't know. So there's Pete and his Kmart paddle. <laughs> and he's out there just paddling around going, hey, this is fun. So the next day, the ramp ranger does the COVID, show me your ID from six feet kind of thing, right? To check everybody's ID. Pete's like, come on, let's go. And off Pete goes. Now I'm going to start giving you some videos of what happens next. And let's see how this works. Fingers crossed. 
for the shade here. There he is. He's doing great. Looks like he chose a line over in the uh, shallows. Staying out of the meat. Gus giving some commentary. Let's zoom out here for a little scale perspective. Big canyon, little boat. Doing great. He looks pretty stable. He's got his feet up. Good strokes. He's doing great. More optimism now than initially. All right, so he is gone into the canyon. Gone, gone, gone. Hi. So that's John Fuller. Now it's really good because what John didn't see was happening right around the corner. John didn't see that. Uh, let's see, did you move that mouse? No, maybe not. So this is what happened around the corner. That's Pete swimming next to lots of knots. John's like, he's doing great. See you later, have a good trip. So we were like, oh, first rapid, Pete didn't do so well. And he didn't even turn on his GoPro because it's just the first time in a little riffle, right? Well, the next thing I know, okay, you gotta help me, Donna. There it is. Ah, all right, go. Oh, and then I pushed it too far. All right, we're, we're cruising along with this. Let's see, unless it goes back. Yep, it's gonna get a little fussy now. Back to the part of slide. It's just slow. Okay. So the next thing I know, Pete is right back in the saddle paddling again, like nothing happened. And if I hadn't seen him go over in the Priya Riffle, I'd have never known it. So we had on, and this is New Year's Eve, and he first big rapid is Badger. So let's see what happens there. Yeah. He's happy. Says. Huh. So I was worried, would he be able to keep up with the rafts? I started realizing the rafts had to work hard to keep up with Pete. This thing cruises. It's a real cruiser. Okay, the next rapid we need to deal with is house rock. These rapids just get worse and worse and bigger and bigger in Grand Canyon. So what's going to happen now? I need to mention, as this thing spools up, we were told by the kayakers no. he should use thigh straps. And you can see the thigh straps between his legs. He has abandoned them. He's like, no, 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 no. no. Thank you. 
is my girl close to what we do? And then he's going to tell everybody with his hand on his head, yeah, I'm okay. Leave me alone. It's back in the thing. Eventually. Again, think, which is, this is 2,000 years ago. The river is warm. There's no dam. Okay, I got all the time in the world. This is my life jacket. My raft is my life jacket. Ah. I'm just going to stay with my yeah, raft. Fine. I know how to fish. I know how to swim. Jim's like, dude, you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. And then what happens? Let's see. So on New Year's Day, we made some changes. Pete wants a backrest. He's an old man like me. So I find this piece of driftwood and we, we tie it on here with a bunch of straps and we're gonna put his backrest right on that thing. Now in the rapids, he's gonna slide forward and put his feet around this thing. Otherwise, he's just gonna sit up there on his little throne and paddle along. Did it do it? It did it. All right, we gotta wait, we gotta be patient. So he's paddling along, everything's just fine. Here we go. Day after day after day. And he's like, I got it. This is gonna work. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, that guy, Charlie? Uh-oh. Did he go back? Did you want the film? Yeah, I want that film. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's thinking about it. That one? You know what? Let's just leave it right there. So I was going to show a bunch of placid flat water. Here's the plan. By this time, lots of knots is supposed to be on the back of a raft, right? You've seen kayaks on the backs of rafts. That was the plan. The plan is not happening. Pete Brown is still paddling this thing very happily. And he's telling me, I'm going to make it. It's going to make it. It's going to do it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's supposed to be on the back of the raft. You're supposed to be rowing Hazel's raft. She's getting in the gym with me. That was the plan, Pete. Hazel's like, yeah, I'll keep rowing because Pete's still paddling. So we just kept going. So this is a little Nanka. We, we did a layover here. And let's see what happens. I'm going to introduce the people on the trip one by one by one as we go along. Conan Bliss, if you can get a chance to boat with Conan, get him on your trip. The guy has, he's an Everest guide, you know, so like he's been taking people up to the top of Everest. He's summoned it a couple of times. Just a great guy. Who else is on that trip? Let's see. These guys, father and son, the Thrill Kill team. Craig and his dad, Stephen. Having family on a trip brings really cool dynamics to your trip. That is really precious. I, 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 just, I just think that's really cool. So Pete's going out for a hike at Little Nankawi. Every day we would take the boat out, stand it up on end, let it drain out, sit in the sun. It is um, early January and this is Grand Canyon and you shouldn't see this guy in his shorts. No, it's cold. You don't wanna go in the middle of January. It's why I can't get a permit in the middle of January. Some people have figured this out. On downstream, the salt, we did a layover did more drying. I did some work here to fix this thing. I'm in there just checking the knots, tying things together. What you can see is all these bundles that we have now have segregated out into kind of main bundles. Oh, that's interesting. I'm fiddling with the thing and, and I hear this <clears throat> and I turn around and there's a kayaker sitting in the eddy there. He's Tyler Williams from Flagstaff. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, Tyler, I haven't a clue what I'm doing, <laughs> but it's working. <laughs> so then there's a rapid called Hans. 
And Hans is one of the biggest rapids we have. Pete didn't get his GoPro going. He was trying really hard. But these are the pictures from the high scout watching Pete from the top. What you're supposed to do in Hans is avoid Emilio's hole, a boat flipping hole, which you can't see as you float into this rapid. What you can see is the lighthouse. It sticks up like a big rocky thumb and you're supposed to go to the lighthouse. And if you do that, you go to the lighthouse, you can see suddenly the rocks in front of you, you need to miss. You miss those rocks, you make your run and you clear Emilio's hole. That sounds simple, right? I mean, it is simple. That's, that's what you're supposed to do in this rapid. What Pete is dinking with his GoPro. <laughs> is he going? And at this point, Fiona calls out to him, dude, you're on your own. <laughs> and Pete's like, what? Because he's realized he doesn't want to run this hole. <laughs> so he goes to the right of it. Okay, the right side of Hans is a great place to be for a while. <laughs> for a short while. And Pete does a good job of it for a while. But you can see there's a whole ledge of carnage down there that he's gonna go explore with his little grass boat. And guess what? It's not gonna go real well for him. Well, you guys already figured that out. But Pete's like, hey, I'm wearing a life jacket. I'm in a dry suit. I've got a big floating life jacket next to me. Just hang on to my paddle and hang on to the boat. And eventually, what am I going to do? I'm going to climb back on and keep going. Let's see if this will work. <laughs> So by the time they got the throw bag unbuckled from the boat, Pete was back on lots of knots in a bad run of hands. We went for a hike. <laughs> and let's see. I'm, I'm typing in the link to the bottom of this. And I'm and I'm pushing the button and it's not advancing. Yeah. Did it advance? Did you see it? I don't know. It, no, it did. Give me a second. Okay. It's Vishnu Net or Vishnu Temple Vishnu Press. Vishnu Temple Press dot com. Okay. Yeah. Somebody has to leave. So yeah. Like Understood. Okay. All right. So you yeah. got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just there it is. Okay. That's our camp. And so we're just gonna we're gonna burn along here because we're we're running behind. This the internet is really okay. There we go. Keep going. One more. Give me a phantom ranch. It's Black Bridge and the Ranger. So we get the phantom. And we want to tell the ramp ranger back at Lee's Ferry that we got the phantom. Go back one. Again. So we run up the phantom ranch where we get the lemonade, right? Because he got candy bars up there. And we find a park service employee with a weapon and we say, hey, can you send an email to the ranger at Lee's Ferry? And he's like, why? I said, well, because our boat made of grass, made it here. And he's like, what are you talking about? Let me see this. 
So he comes down, nice guy, sees the boat, says, yeah. He puts out this entire park service email. Hey, these guys made it to Phantom with this boat made of grass. How cool is that? I'm kind of shell-shocked at this time. Not only did Kennard say it, it shouldn't happen. Did it do it? But I'm looking here past the photographer that took this picture at what's called the Bright Angel Pueblo. And at this point, I'm wondering what kind of lemonade did they have for the river runners a thousand years ago? That's what I'm thinking. What do you got for me? Let's go to Horn Creek. Horn Creek is a, the next pretty big rapid, pretty big, it's a big rapid, just down below Phantom. What do you think happens to Pete in Horn Creek? Okay, it's coming. Be patient. Taking corrective action. Wow. He aced it. That's a good run. Donna, should I try this or are you doing it? What do we got? I granite. Yeah, yeah. Granite. He's going to make granite. Do you want to watch it? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Poor people in Zoom, you've been out voting. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, what? Yeah. He made his line. I didn't like a horse. Okay. What do you got for me? Hermit. You want to watch Hermit? He nails Hermit. All right. They want to see Hermit. Here we go. Hermit is really fun. Man. like a duck. Next slide. So that's, I mean, it's just, he's just starting to knock him out now. He's learned. And the boat doesn't stand up and get hit by the waves. It is submarining through stuff. And he's the one who's getting hit. Not the boat. And it's just floating along. What do you got? We're going to just flip through some of these now. Okay. There's Pete at Bass Camp, like blown dry hair. Stacy Davenport helped build the boat. David Art. You want a boat with these people. They're great people. Matthew, Lu uh, Matthew Arnold and Kelsey Loopy out of, out of Boulder. You want a boat with these people. How is lots of knots doing by this time? Well, it's showing a little wear as would be expected. 
The outer Thule is starting to bend a little bit. Okay, understood, but so far so good. There are more rapids ahead. Oh yeah, I forgot the little bow in the front. It looks like a brush ox now, huh, Shaggy? But it's still there, sort of. Yeah, yeah, fire, come on, with the ambiance. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, hey, Jane Martin, she's my niece. She was on a trip, family, fun. Big rock. Okay, Big here, rock Peter. Show that clip. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what's going to happen, right? What do we got? Upset. Upset is a shore run near shore. Just watch him go right on by. But what? There's a big rapid coming up. What's it called? La La Lava. Oh yeah, she mentioned Hazel Clark, who was supposed to be with me and the gem, and Pete was supposed to be here with lots of knots draped over the gear pile, and the back didn't happen. You don't want to see lava. Of course, nobody wants to see that. Right? All right, run me This is the classic bubble line on the right. Nice and nice. To the right of the ledge hole. There's the view. Okay. What did you expect to happen? I've done that. Is my GoPro still there? Ah, shoot! He's mad. He's mad. Come on, you're drowning. Come on. All right. And off he goes. So from down below, let's see if this is going to work. Oh, oops. Can you go back? Can you go back one? From down below with the long lens. Con and Bliss is here in his kayak. There's Pete and lots of nuts. And there's Fiona in her kayak. So we're just safety. I mean, we're just thinking about this. If Pete is alive, leave him alone. If the boat goes one way, one of you follow the boat, the other one follow Pete. All right, that's the plan. And what happens? Well, he gets knocked off, but he hangs onto his paddle and he hangs onto his boat. And there he is. And he runs lower lava, right? Along the right-hand shore, just boop de boop de boop Down to uh, what we call Truffle Beach. Some people used to call it Tequila Beach, but not too many people die drinking too much. So it's Truffle Beach, everybody gets a truffle. And it's just like doop de doop de doop de doop de doop de doop 
And off we go. I, but this point, I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't believe this. I just don't believe this. We go for another hike, keep going. Now you're going to start burning up. Just Callie Spitzen, David Grego, just amazing people. You want to boat with these people? Lots of knots at this point is showing some troubles. This is where Pete's feet are sitting. He's dug with his boots through the first layer of Thule, just the first layer. Hey, that's Mark Appleman. Mark Appleman, raise your hand. Mark Appleman's over there in the corner. He was on this trip. You don't believe me, go talk to him. What do we got? Next slide. There's Mark. Yeah. You want to boat with that guy? He rode his own boat. It's a good guy. We got down to separation and we took a little group photo here. There's Pete on the left, Stacy Davenport, Fiona, and Hazel. Now, in this area of the canyon, it's not what it used to be. Hoover Dam has changed this section. There were some hard rapids in here. What would have happened if we had to run those rapids, which would have happened 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 years ago? By this point, Pete's well dialed into his boat. He's got it. The chances of success with or without rapids is basically assured. Off we go. We've got a group photo coming up. Yeah, it snows, it rains. Yeah, we got to do all that winter stuff. It's not all shorts. Snow up there on the horizon. There's Pete paddling along. Boop, doo, 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 doo. Nick Spolinski out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Spolinski, you want to boat with this guy. This fellow here I want to mention, Michael Stock. Kelsey and Matthew being professors, they had to leave at Lava once they ran the rapid. At Lava, they're like, we're done. We got to go back to teach class. And Michael Stock hiked in and took over their boat. You want to boat with these people. Every person I mentioned, I want to boat with again. I want to go to hell with heavenly boaters because we will have a good time. If I go to heaven with hellish boaters, it's not going to work out real well. This was a heavenly group. This is the Grand Wash Cliffs. Pete has gone 277 miles here. We take that picture. He's out into the basin range. This is a cow pie. Uh, camp here, and there's Pete and little lots of nuts, and I'm just like, I can't believe this. I'm going to thank all these people for letting me use their videos and their photographs. What else you got here? Lots of nuts goes back up on the trailer and goes to a museum in Page, Arizona. So that's where that boat is, and here's the real takeaway. We, yes, we were the first to document a Thule Reed watercraft going through Grand Canyon, but we're not the first to do it. I pretty much guarantee you that. I've got legend that says it was done. I've got people doing it when Europeans first showed up. All we did was proof of concept, but others have already said they've done it. I'm just saying. And yeah, we live to tell the tale. So nice sunset picture, you know, it's always nice. Hey, guess what? This is a fundraiser for the Adobe Whitewater Club. You need to be a member of this organization. If you're not, it's only 15 bucks a year. You people in Zoom land, do it online, pay with PayPal. It's really easy. What do you got? <coughs> I think I'm a slide ahead here. Oh, yeah, there are these books here, vishnutemplepress.com. For you Zoom people, proceeds go to Adobe Whitewater Club. You people that are here in the room, go check out what's on the table over there. What do you got? Yep, Adobe Whitewater Club, thank you very much. And questions, what do you got? What was the river level? What was the river level? The river level was uh, eight to 10, I think. As, oh, um, Mark, what do you got? Higher. Higher. What do we got? What do you remember? Well, we, we did. The rafts all ran left at lava. It was a little bumpy over there. Look for January flows on the USGS. You can figure that out. 
Again, pre-dam, the flows would be up to 100,000 CFS every 10 years on average. And in September, sometimes the flows would bottom out if the monsoons didn't show up and it'd run down to three or 4,000. And then it would drop down again in January and December down to three or 4,000, maybe five. And in September, October, the water was running about 70 degrees. Wow, okay, pretty nice water to go boating in. At the end, or at the beginning also? At the beginning, there was no dam. By the time the water reached oh, okay. Lee's Ferry, it was hot, water was hot. It got hotter as they went. Yeah, yeah good question. Um, what was the flow and how cold was it? Questions? So if anybody on Zoom land wants to raise their hand, we can just call on you as well. Question. What's your theory about uh, carrying provisions before wraps just on this type of wrap? So you're asking a really good question, which is what kind of provisions could I bring on my Thule boat? Well, remember our Thule boat is a whisk room compared to the really cool boats that the indigenous people built. If we had two bigger bundles with little gunnels on top, now I've got room to sit higher up off the water and I got room behind me for a backrest made of my gear. I don't need a pooper, I don't have a pocket pad, I don't have a chair, I don't have a partner stove, I have no propane, I get rid of all that stuff. Maybe I've got some fishing tackle because I know how to fish. Maybe I've got some nap stones. Maybe I got a bow and arrow because I'm going to be looking for, maybe I'm going to get some beaver. Okay, I got this all figured out. I know where the drinking water is. I'm paddling over it. I got food, shelter, and clothing all figured out. How much gear do I need? Now, the Park Service had never proved that. <laughs> but it begs the question. Can we do a Thule boat self-support trip? What would we need and how would we do it? Things are very different today, I understand that. But you're asking a dynamite question, which is what would I need a thousand years ago if I had the skills, I knew how to use them, I knew how to live off the land, and I had water in the desert, which is what the Grand Canyon is water in the desert. I've got water and I'm paddling on food. I got fish, I got beaver. Wow. That's my question. That's my answer. I don't know. I got legends that say, yeah, we did it. Yeah, we have a question from Diane. Uh, she said, the boat is in a museum in Page. What's the name of the museum? The name of the museum in Page is a really good question because it, it matches the museum in Green River, Utah. It's the John Wesley Powell Museum, but it's in Page. So that's why I say it's in a museum in Page. And there's only one museum in Page, which is the John Wesley Powell, but it's not in Green River. So don't go there looking for the boat because it's over there. <laughs> question? Do your legends or your research uh, give any idea of why folks back then would have done this? This is a really good question. Okay, they could have done it. Why would they do it? I, this is a really important question. Because they traded goods all up and down the river. And if the people from the lower basin, if, you, you got you to, because I slipped that in there really fast. If the people from the lower basin traded by going to the people in the upper basin with trade goods, which they did, why wouldn't they build a boat to go home? So I have an if and a why, okay? So if I have the skills and I find myself in Glen Canyon, standing in a, in a, in a forest of Thule, and I'm like, hmm, I've been following this river for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, maybe three months, I followed this river or I was up on the highlands and I got back down to the river. That's my home river. Let's boat it home. Yeah, I wouldn't know what was in there in the middle, but why wouldn't I try it? 
because the lower basin is like nothing rapid wise. So let's give it a go. And I'm going to start with the baby rapids in Glen Canyon. And I'm slowly going to do what all river runners do today. They start at Lee's Ferry and they work on their skills and they get better as they go. And eventually I'm riding the thing in Lava Falls going, yeah, oh, well, I got kicked off. Hang on to my paddle. If and why, what do you think? Just do it. If, if they were carrying trade goods, they might well have done what Powell did, line the boat. Well, this is an interesting question now. If I'm going to go to trade somewhere, I'm going to end up with a bunch of stuff I want to take home. Yeah. Right? I'm going to put that in the back of the boat. And I'm going to protect that. Who invented scouting rapids? Okay, this isn't like rocket science here. I got some stuff I want to protect. I hear a funky sound I don't recognize. I'm going to shore and I'm walking down a ways. And there was a lot of sand back then and walking along the river corridor was way easier than it is today. Yeah. So we have a question from John Karen. What native group has the boat legend? The Hopi and the Navajo. Yeah, did you get that, John? You can unmute yourself if you wish, John. Yeah, sure, thanks. Did you get it, that answer, John? Yes, but is the Hopi legend the one about the log, or is it different? The Hopi legend is the log. This is the story of Teo. But my question is, who translated the word, and what happens over time with the story? And if I'm not a boater because I've lost that, how do I translate that word? What do I mean? Now, maybe it was a hollowed out log that he sealed up. But what's a skirt after all? It's something I seal up, isn't it? I don't know. You're asking questions that are above my pay grade <laughs> because this is not my culture and I, I just don't understand. All I can do is point to the legends and say, there they are. How cool is that? Question. Do you have any indication what the panel selection looked like at the Kmart a thousand years ago? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. What was the paddle selection like a thousand years ago? There were kayaks a thousand years ago. There were birch bark canoes a thousand years ago. These people knew how to build paddles. This, this, this drawing from the 1800s shows a double-bladed paddle. The Kujak, they were using double-bladed paddles. We call them kayaks today. That's what kind of Walmart they had <laughs> a thousand years ago, was a cruddy little double-bladed thing, just like Pete would use it. Yeah, um, they did it. They had it. It just, it's, it's, it's amazing. Do you know anything about uh, Pueblo people using boats? This is a really good question. Did the Pueblo people use boats? Well, the Hopi are Pueblo people, the Navajo Pueblo people. I, Navajo and so, Pueblo people. well, that's true. They, they, they came in late in the, in the theory. They, they don't say they came in late. Okay, fine. I'm not going to get in that argument. Yeah. But what Pete is doing now is looking at rock art. And he's starting to find some crazy looking rock art. And I should have put those slides in here. I'll do that next time. Which is, wow, that looks kind of like a boat. That's an answer we don't know. Um, it just, we can find the stuff that's protected with overhangs, right? Because the Southwest is an open air museum. But Thule gets repurposed. The boats end up, if they float away during a high water flood for any reason, they're down in the silt, they disintegrate quickly. That record is hard to track. 
So that's the best thing. Got. You got proof of concept. We got to look elsewhere now and put the street cred where the street care really is, is with the indigenous peoples. Now that you've done this, what other concepts or ideas have sparked in your mind is the next thing to do in this area? I'm hoping, this is a really good question. What's next after this? I'm hoping that some indigenous people decide to do this on their own. And let's see what they learn. And let's see what they do, right? Um, let's get out of the way. Let's let somebody else do it. Let's see what they come up with. Do we need all those knots? But we use 16th inch, I should have mentioned 16th inch nylon. What if we actually used braided tule or braided agave or, or a grapevine? Okay, strong, flexible, right? But you're gonna braid some, it takes a while to do. And are you gonna make a zillion of them just because you got a whole spool of rope? No, you're gonna be a little more judicious. Yeah, and you're gonna make a homemade paddle. So we're getting out of the way. And let's see what happens now. Can I answer that question? For you personally. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into the history mines and I'm gonna write more about the history of river running as Marston found it. Because that 1947 permit, that was the start of permitting for the Colorado River. And it spread like wildfire. By the early 1950s, dinosaur was doing the same thing. And the permit system said. We like the commercial people and we don't want the do-it-yourself people. The director of the park service said that. Whoa, that story needs to come out. We need to understand the roots, our foundational management roots of river running. It's not a happy story. People are like, oh, you hate the commercial people. I'm like, no, I hate them. This is the story. This is what happened. We need to get that story out. That's where I'm going. Looking forward to that. Got it right, man. It's it's um 430 boxes. You can come help look. <laughs> well, with that, maybe we should wrap this up. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you. So what I what, just wanted to say, I thought your idea was not only brilliant, but talking somebody else into paddling the thing was <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Okay. Chuck, did you have a question? <clears throat> no. Oh, okay. That was just popping. Thank you. Cool. I'll go ahead and close this out. Uh, just real quick, I want to remind everybody to go to Vishnu Temple Press. Uh, check out their website. Check out the great selection of books that Tom's written. Um, again, if you order before 8th, 9th, 10th, November 10th, it counts towards our credit for the Adobe Whitewater Club. Uh, thanks to Tom and Hazel for showing up tonight, driving all the way out from Flagstaff just to make our meeting and bringing their great books and great stories. And I hope you've enjoyed our show tonight. Tom's a great entertainer. And thanks again for Tom for coming out.